What's going on, my friends? Welcome back. Welcome back to the channel. This is the first interview of the Market Watch Mondays, and there's no better guest that I could have brought on than the homie Jesse Reeves. Uh, if you know those guys have been around Dynasty Twitter for a while, you'll know who Jesse is. You know, he was an OG before I even came on the scene, and I remember following him and just learning a lot about his data approach, and I, that's like the, the calculator approach that I actually really appreciated. Uh, we had back and forth on Twitter. Sometimes we got into it, but like never like disrespectful or anything like that. You know me, I'm kind of a prick. Jesse's a nice dude. So he handled me as, as nice dudes would handle someone, uh, someone like me, some assholes like me, but it's, it's been, um, it's been a pleasure. He took a little bit of a break, was a legend in like the TikTok gaming space, Twitch streams, all that stuff, grinding out, building a brand there. And now he's kind of back in the fold trying to get back more into uh, dynasty and fantasy football Twitter. And, you know, we're, we're freaking happy to have them. Uh, so, you know, without further ado here, no, no, sorry. People always blame me on this without further ado. Uh, here <laughs> is the homie, Jesse, Jesse, say hello to the friends, say hello to the channel of the BDGE YouTube squad. Uh, let them know a little bit about you. Let them know where to find you, how to support you and why the King is back in town. Man, okay. First of all, way too many kind words coming out of your mouth about me. Okay, um, you, you know, listen. I do remember when we were coming up in the space together, man, and uh, just just seeing like where where both of us, but you in particular, where you've come from in in just the fantasy space and just in fucking life, man. It's just been it's been a cool ride to watch you kind of grow and stuff. And um, uh, so thank you for having me on first and foremost, dude. I believe we were just talking about it. this is our first like one on one podcast yeah. or just like straight video interaction with each other. So super excited to be here. Um, I, I don't know if I could say anything about myself better than what you just did. I mean, you hyped me up. I hope I'm able to live up to that hype here tonight. Um, but yeah, again, I appreciate you having me on, man. Everybody that's listening or whatever, you guys can find me on Twitter at Jesse Reeves FF. Um, I was not a legend in the gaming space. I was just, you know, I'm a has been now I'm a has been in, in all facets of life, but I am here to have fun. I'm excited to be here, man. I know um, you do really cool shit on this podcast, man. And I was super excited that you asked me to be on, man. Um, like I said, you're somebody that I followed for a really long time when you were coming up in the industry, when I was coming up in the industry and I just nothing but really good things to say about you as a person, uh, as an analyst, um, air quotes analyst, uh, you know, cause we're not, <laughs> yeah. we're, you know, we just talk about fucking fantasy football. Um, but yeah, again, man, thank you for having me on. I really do appreciate it, dude. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's super cool because you know I, I like having people on the show. Uh, at least for me, this is a strategy based show, right? So I don't I don't go too much into like you know who's the dynasty wide receiver one, blah blah blah. Like I like to do that with guests because you know it's something to talk about. But you know I love learning about people's like processes, right? So you know I have my own process. It's not perfect, you know it works, it does the job, and I try to improve on every year. But I know you were someone that definitely had a very very you know. I don't want to say strict because that sounds bad, but like a very, very like structured like process. And you, you had like, it was, it was great to watch because, you know, you, you could like see how you thought about players based on the data you were presenting. And you would come on here, you would present your view on a player and you'd show, you know, all your, all your metrics. You're like, Hey, this is why I think this, I like this guy. And I like that type of approach because one, it leaves, it leaves receipts to, to either be dunked on or to dunk with uh, <laughs> down the, down the line, but also, you know, I'm of the mantra when it comes to fantasy, like I like to teach people how to think, not tell people what to do. And I think like probably 90, 95, maybe 99% of Twitter is like, you know, people saying this is what you should do. Like buy this player, sell this player, don't buy this player, don't sell this player. And that's, I think that's a very, very saturated market. Uh, a very unsaturated market in the, in the fantasy space is like dynasty strategy. And that's really where all of my content comes from. Uh, so I like to see other people's processes because even if we don't agree, right? Like I can always look at your process and say, that makes sense. You know, I, I, I can see why he thinks like that. You know, I might not have come to the same conclusion, but be, because you've laid it out the way that you do, like it, it makes it much more easy for discussion. It makes it much more easy for, you know, actual legit debate. Cause you know, you go on Twitter sometimes and the shit just devolves. It's like, uh, well, you know, straw man a, and then the other guys, oh, no, no, straw man B. And like, neither of them said any fucking anything. And they're <laughs> just arguing against thin air, uh, presenting arguments nobody cares about. But like, I think that's really where a structured debates comes from. Is that how you got into like the analytics game? Were you always part of the analytics game? Cause I remember you being in film too. And then you started getting a lot more heavy into numbers. Like walk me through a little bit about that process, like how you kind of evolve your process over time and how you kind of became a little bit of a, of a numbers guy. 
Yeah. So my process always first and foremost started with just watching football. I think like a lot of people in the space or just anyone that gets into fantasy football, uh, we all watch it, or at least a lot of us do. Right. Um, we watch what's happening on the field. And then I think uh, like at the beginning of my process, a lot of it was like intuition, you know, I mean, I remember it had to have been like 2000 and 13 or 14 i remember taking like jimmy graham round one at the like 109 pick in like a, a home league of mine and like looking back on that like jimmy graham was exceptional but it's like probably shouldn't have taken him there you know with that yeah. amount of capital and i don't have receipts to back that up whether or not he was or was not worth that but like it was intuition it was like jimmy graham was coming off a prolific you know receiving season like this is my guy so that's kind of how i started getting into fantasy football and just watching it i mean um, I've, I've been a huge chargers fan for the better part of the last, you know, decade and a half and, um, just watching it kind of got it, got me into working with fantasy football. And I just remember coming into like the Twitter space and realizing that like, holy shit, like there's other people that like fantasy football as much as me. And like, there's probably a lot more people that I had like no idea about. And I just started writing like dumb shit on Twitter. I just started writing stupid things about like people that I liked. And then, um, you know, fortune favors the bold. And I actually got into, I think it had to have been a Twitter engagement with Peter Howard and mm -hmm. that man, he just, I, I, I found myself in a predicament where I couldn't argue with him <laughs> and where nothing that I said mattered because he was working. He was like, I was, I had one hand tied behind my back and he had a full it's like tool set of things that he could just rapid fire off at me. And that's when I realized, number one, I'm dumb. Uh, and I really suck at this. And number two, that like, there's an untapped, you know, market and edge in numbers in fantasy football. And that kind of led me down this rabbit hole of looking at metrics um, year to year, finding new ones, whether those be efficiency, volume, and just kind of getting deeper and deeper into the numbers. And then I have to say, like, as I was coming up in like the, the industry and the space, it just became more and more like prevalent that, um, the analytics were just kind of the way to go that the numbers don't lie. People generally will. And of course there's nuance in that statement, right? I'm not, you know, it's not set in stone. Analytics aren't hundred percent, but it, it's the damn near most perfect thing we can get to. And I fell in love with that aspect. I fell in love kind of with what you were talking about, about being able to present my process and have the receipts to either get dunked on or to be praised for. And that kind of was a form of, um, a form of analysis that only few people do very, very well. And no matter how good I get, I will always feel like I'm not as good as those people. And that's something that keeps me striving to like find, you know, what metric is next, which one is more predictable. How can I get an edge on, you know, John that works a nine to five comes home, checks his fantasy roster and sets it the night before Sunday. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to be better than that guy. Just that's the competitive nature in me. So that's what kind of led me down the road of analytics. And I just, I really never stopped with it. So um, yeah, dude, that's, that's kind of my start. That's how my process was born. And, um, and those receipts, those damn receipts, they get me in trouble sometimes, but it, it's, I, I like having them in, in the form of numbers. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that that's really the crux of it. Right. Cause like when you, when you debate film, at least when I see people debate film, it's like, it's so subjective at times where people see like everyone watches the same film and they get, you know, they get a million different, uh, different, like, you know, re results or different takeaways. Um, but you know, when you have the numbers, like numbers really don't lie. I mean, honestly, people say film doesn't lie either. And I, I can agree with that to an extent, but the way that it's used in the, in the public space, like it definitely can lie because people can just say whatever. And there's really no way you can do it to prove it, but like numbers are there, right. When you go and get, go into debate with Peter Howard, he's just like, yo, this guy sucks because of this. And this is an X percent hit rate. It's like, well, I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. Those are facts. It's just, <laughs> that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. And like you said, I think, I think it's both things, right? One hand is film, one, one hand is analytics. I think not using either one is a little bit of a disservice to yourself. I'm not a good film watcher. So I go and follow people that are good film watchers. I mean, I can watch, a, I can watch a guy play and be like, yo, that guy's pretty damn good but I can't tell you like, you know, which gap he was supposed to hit, you know, which route he was supposed to run, where he's supposed to stem it, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So that's why I rely on, you know, you know, guys, other guys on Twitter. So I think it's really great that, you know, you have a balanced approach. I think that's where we're similar, right? We, we both have like a very balanced approach. Um, I, I know where I'm weak and I try and plug that with other people that are really good uh, in, in those facets of, of fantasy. And that's really all I can do, right? Nobody's, nobody's going to be good at everything. I mean, 
you know, there's, you know, JJ's the goat of analytics, right. But he, he's not the goat film grinder. Right. And, yeah. you know, you know, Ray's great at film. Right. But he's not the best number like analytics guy. Yeah. Um, but the, the key to all these people being great is they're, they're open to actually learning about other processes and not just look at them and be like, Hey, that's stupid. You know, Ray's always willing to learn film. I mean, learn numbers. JJ's, you know, also look, willing to look at look at uh, the film side via draft grades or whatever it is, right? So it's about being adaptable, and I think that's how you really kind of find success in the fantasy space. At least that, that's what I found. Uh, I always definitely try and do that as well. So, um, but yeah, so that's that's a good good way, good bridge into your process and the way you think. Uh, but the viewers, the channel, the folks, they want to know about you know players as well. So. You know, let's dive a little bit into this rookie class. And I know for you, you know, one of the key metrics you look at for uh, for wide receivers is yards per route run. So obviously we have that at the NFL level. We don't have that as much at the college level, right? Um, unless you're, you're paying for some crazy, crazy expensive data. But there's a lot of great data out there that people can use that's free and widely available. You know, you have Peter Howard's database. What do you look at uh, when it comes to rookies? And I'm, I'm guess let's let's start with wide receivers because that's really where all the where all the juice is. Um, so what what are what are some metrics you're mostly looking for in your process? And you know, when applying that process this year, who are some who are some standouts for you? Yeah. So I've always been in um, an age adjusted kind of um, analytical of, of the age adjusted analytical mind when I'm looking at prospects. So we like to see guys that, that perform well early in their college career or at a young age, right? So mm-hmm. we want them to perform as soon as they come into college um, or at a, a, you know, a really, really good age. Everybody's age is different when they come into college. So there's some nuance there. Like, you know, we, I've seen a lot of people use, you know, what year in college they broke out rather than the age that they use. So there is some nuance there in how, um, in, in how you want to present your case for age adjusted statistics. But I've been a really big fan of things like breakout age, um, market share of receiving yards targets is another good one, um, that correlates to fantasy success. And I think we all know that, that, Volume-based metrics are very, very key when we're looking at fantasy success. We want to see guys that have that that pathway to volume or that are good enough to jump into a situation and take that. And by by identifying, you know, whether these players performed well enough in college and their surroundings and like kind of was around them and what they were doing, we can build a really, really strong case using metrics like breakout age, like market share of receiving yards. Um, Right now, things like um, I know Peter Howard loves yards per team pass attempt uh, for an efficiency metric that he I know he has a lot of that stuff in his foundation. Personally, I like yards per route run right now, um, and I, I will be fully, fully transparent and say I have not tested either one against the other right now. And I'm still in the middle of testing the correlation between yards per route run from a college level and how that translates to an NFL level. Do you have my, that data? You have yards per run data? I do. I do. It's something that I've really fallen in love with. I remember at the beginning of 2020, I did a study, which I'm I'm more more well versed in right now. But I did a study going back all the way to I believe 2009 on every single rookie wide receiver to come in and what their yards per route run were. Um, and how that correlates to fantasy success. And um, again, you guys, anybody that's listening to this, I'm sure you, if you peruse on my profile, you guys can find it. The spreadsheet is out there um, right now for all the rookie wide receivers. And right now I'm in the middle of kind of testing and seeing how yards per hour run fares from the college level to the, um, to the NFL level. Um, but so far right now, outside of like Peter's, you know, yards per team pass attempt and then yards per route run and stuff like that, we haven't really found an efficiency metric. So working those in is few and far between. I would say those are probably the two that reign supreme right now in terms of um, of actual metrics that you want to pay attention to for uh, college prospects. But um, yeah, I'm looking at volume based metrics like market share of, of, of targets, receiving yards, receptions, things like that. Breakout age is is a huge one and and one that's a little less unpredictable, but Kind of what you were talking about in terms of, um, you know, how the film, the, the the film side of fantasy football and the actual like football industry ties into dynasty fantasy football. I think they're a lot closer than people want to admit. I know we play a fake football game, but 
Draft capital is a huge one. Um, draft capital is a huge indicator of where a lot of players um, are going to be viewed by their respective teams. And that forces guys like we're looking in this class in particular, I'll just use the wide receiver class as um, as an example. We're looking at Traylon Burks, Chris Olave, uh, Drake London, Garrett Wilson are some notable names in this class that are pretty much consensus first round wide receivers right now, right? So that that signal from the community, from the actual NFL and football community should probably force a lot of us dynasty players to start looking into these players age adjusted metrics to kind of prepare us on whether or not these players are going to be able to hop right into a situation and dominate, um, get into a situation, be a wide receiver two, maybe they're a wide receiver three and like kind of what that's going to look like. So jumbling all of that together, it's a lot of different metrics and it, it essentially creates an entire profile that we can look at and drop these guys into success buckets that gives us better indication on how we should view them going forward. What type of dynasty assets should I be should I be spending the 103, the 104, and um, give us kind of more a clear view on 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 how we're going to look at these these uh, college prospects coming in? Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned some of the big names. Obviously, I think Traylon Burks like smashes <laughs> a lot of probably not age adjusted, but definitely experience adjusted. So people that do use uh, you know breakout metrics based on years of experience uh, out of high school. He smashes that Drake London, like completely destroys everything uh, until up until he got, he got injured. So we got a couple of those guys and they obviously have big prototype size as well, which is really, really interesting. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Garrett Wilson. Uh, you know, he definitely took a step back in his junior year, but his, his sophomore year was insane uh, in terms of what he was able to do. So I want to talk about one guy that I think is probably a bit more controversial uh, is Chris Olave. So I personally don't like him that much. Uh, but that's because I tend to ding people that don't come out uh, early, but knowing that like there are, there are successes, right? There are the Devonta Smiths who came out and, and was pretty successful in the NFL level. You know, there are those types of guys, but personally I would never put Olave into the same grouping as, as someone. And it comes down to signaling uh, as well. Like for me, it's like, you know, we, we talk about age adjusted, right. And we want these guys to come out earlier and, you know, if they don't, that, that's kind of the NFL system, like in most cases, at least like, yo, you are not good enough to come in as a junior. So I'm always going to take the juniors over him. Maybe, maybe, you know, provide the other side of that coin for the viewers. Like, what do you like about Chris Olaf? And I guess the other thing is he's not really that big. He's not going to be like a, like an alpha type of wide receiver. Uh, so that doesn't really get me as excited either. Um, but what do you like about Olave? So one thing that kind of stands out to me, whether you're choosing to look at the raw statistics or the age adjusted metrics is that Chris Olave is pretty consistent from his freshman after his freshman season on. So he's not a guy, especially if you're looking at raw statistics that is going to capture you and be like, man, this guy absolutely dominated, right? He absolutely dominated the game of college football. He looks like he's just going to come in and be an absolute stud. One thing that I, that, that really catches my eye about him is the consistency at which he stayed um, over the the twenty percent threshold that we're looking at for for things like market share of uh, receiving yards outside of his freshman year? Um, he was consistently in the twenties, except for his last season. I believe his best receiving uh, market share is uh, of yards is uh, roughly about like thirty five percent, which is outstanding. That's a really really good amount, and I believe that was his last season. Not not this past season, but the season before that. I could be completely wrong. Um, <clears throat> it was his junior year. Yeah, it was his junior year. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it was his junior year. And again, he's going to get dinged on that last season, not an early declare coming out. The thing that I kind of keep going back to with Chris Olave is, is two things. One, he he produced at a, a very solid level despite the, the, the quarterbacks that were throwing to him and despite the talent that was around him. Now, when we, if you're looking at like a direct comparison between Chris Olave and, um, and, uh, excuse me, Garrett Wilson, especially like over this last season, you're going to look at Garrett Wilson and you're going to say, Oh my God, that's like, that's the wide receiver one. That's the guy I want to spend my early draft capital on. That's fine. Let Chris Olave slip a little bit because I think he's going to be a good investment for you based on the fact that he was consistently minus this last year. And I know people are going to ding it on him he was consistently able to capture above a 20% threshold of his market share of his team's team's yards. He broke out in an early age too. I believe age 19 was when he first captured that um, mm -hmm. the, the above 20% share. And he's right now consensus to look as a first round draft pick. Okay. So 
with the projected draft capital, and look, I don't care if I'm not supposed to do it or not, or whatever. I'm going to do it anyways for the fun, the 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 the, the purpose of this segment right now. Um, let's just assume he gets first round draft capital, and say he goes to a team that maybe already has an alpha wide receiver one. It's apparent that he can still have a healthy market share of his team's receiving yards and targets, and still produce despite not being entered like. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Despite not being thrust into a role where he has to be the alpha, he's mm-hmm. going to come in and he has a pretty high probability of being able to capture at the very least like high end wide receiver two sort of numbers in points per game in fantasy, especially with that first round draft capital. That's the noise of the NFL. When somebody spends a first round draft cap, the first round pick on, on a, on a player, especially when we're talking like mid, mid, like I know people like those early round picks or those, those early first round picks, but even in the middle, anywhere between 10 to like 20, 21, 22, those are, those are all premium picks on players. And a team that is investing in a guy like Chris Olave obviously wants him to come in and start and be impactful. I think that, and when you insulate it with a little bit of the fact that he broke out at age 19, which is fairly young, um, and he comes in with being able to handle having guys like um, like Jackson Smith and you know Garrett Wilson on his team and still being able to obtain some form of production there, I think that's pretty telling. Now, the success bucket that we're going to drop him in is, might not be an alpha one, but it is one worth investing in and one that I, that, that I really think pending where he goes in his situation, one that could be conducive for him to be a steady and consistent fantasy producer um, going forward after his, his rookie season. Yeah, I think, you know, it all comes down to cost in the day. Like, if someone else is going to drop a first-round uh, rookie pick on him, I'm definitely out. If someone's looking at early second, I would consider it. And in the mid-second, I'm definitely considering it because at that point, like you said, draft capital is going to be a big factor. If he does go in the first round at all, um, you'll, you'll definitely have to kind of adjust there. Um, the, the, but, yeah, like, my only knock against him is, like, that last year, it is hard to ignore because – you look at a Devonta Smith and you look at the age adjusted curve, even though he stayed that last year, he smashed, right? Yeah. He absolutely smashed and he was dominant. He, you know, he went out, won the Heisman, whatever. So that, you know, that alone, you know, maybe helps him a little bit, but Chris Olave last year, like he, he barely, barely just touched the point two. And, you know, granted that's because Jackson Smith is an absolute baller. And even Garrett Wilson came down a lot this year because Jackson Smith just kind of took over yeah. uh, and maybe, <clears throat> And maybe that is a that is the point that you know that we can we can kind of look past on a lot of it. I do know that a lot of film guys out there uh, do kind of like him. Uh, for me, yeah, it's all going to come down to cost. But you know, when it comes down to the top guys, <coughs> the ones that we're talking about, it's it's the Drake London, it's Traylon Burks. Honestly, it's those two guys first, and then you know Garrett Wilson to me is kind of like in a tier by himself. By himself, and then. The next guy who I think is going to be very polarizing is Jameson Williams. Personally, I don't know what to do yet with Jameson Williams. So, you know, a lot of people might say like, well, you know, uh, Jalen Waddle, obviously, you know, he, he was a speedster and he was at Alabama and he, he didn't break out and, you know, he, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. And he, he worked out and that, that might be all true, but I'm a, I'm a flex here real quick because like as an analyst guy, I, I loved Jalen Waddle last year because you could, you could craft a really good story for him. You know, he was the most productive guy on the team when he was a freshman out of Devonta Smith and Henry Ruggs. He obviously had a really bad sophomore year, his third year as a junior, he was on track to outpace Devonta Smith in terms of percentage of uh, receiving yards and, uh, and, and all that stuff. And then he, you know, he, he injured his ankle and, and then, you know, the rest was history. And obviously he's worked out to be a smashing success. I mean, Jill and Waddle, people that don't know how good of a year he had, he is closer to Jamar chase than any other wide receiver in the class is to him. So if you think about it that way, like I'm not saying he is Jamar chase, but he, he's, he's in his own tier and he's closer to Jamar chase than anyone else like Devonta Smith or Rashad Bateman. Any of those guys are close to him. So that, and, and also that's just like a little bit of an aberration. Right. And, but we don't have that story for Jameson Williams. James Williams was, was a no show uh, in his previous school. And he transferred here and all of a sudden he became an absolute star. And I would be foolish to say that I watched the game of college football and say, that guy is not a good football player. I can't do that. But here's the thing. Here's the challenge is like, what story do we craft for a Jamison Williams? Because we don't have the crowded wide receiver Alabama theory anymore because all the good wide receivers left. Jalen Waddle's gone. Devonta Smith is gone. John Mechie stinks. I don't care what anyone says. Um, so 
what what story are you crafting? Where are you at with Jameson Williams? I want to know another from another fellow numbers guy. He obviously smashed this year. And if you just look at this year, uh, he definitely is well, well, well above the not well above, but he is above at least above the receiving yards market line. So uh, based on a on a year on a year experience on experience adjusted basis, but we only have that one data point because all the other ones he stunk. So it's tough, man. It's tough. What, what are you, what are your thoughts on, on a Jameson Williams? Like, what are you doing with him in this class? Yeah. If, if I had to say right now, because I'm at the same place as you are, he's kind of an enigma right now, right? Like he's kind of this, this profile that it's weird that he went to Ohio state and admittedly, I don't know entirely what the situation there was, whether he just wasn't getting playing time, that the, the wide receiver room was too crowded for him to kind of break out. But it's, I think there's something to be said for the fact that a guy leaves Ohio state and then goes to Alabama, one of the most, you know, prestigious, you know, wide receiver universities in the entire country. I mean, they're just known for pumping out wide receiver after wide receiver. And he goes there and he just absolutely dominates, right? He just absolutely dominates in terms of touchdown market share. We're talking about receiving market share. He was just the guy. I mean, John Mechie got a lot of targets. I mean, more than him, but I mean, realistically, Jamison Williams just outproduced him flat out, even with less volume. Um, so for me, it's like, it, it's he has an interesting profile because if we do look at age adjusted metrics, I, I believe I have him marked down at like a 20. So we do see signs of him grabbing and, and not even just 20 at a 20% breakout age, but at a 30, right? Yeah. So 30 kind of signals to anybody that's interested in, in age adjusted metrics that 30 is kind of like that where we, we just cut the, we, we cut all the bullshit off. If you hit over 30, we're talking like you're, you're doing, and if you do it at a young age too, you're doing really, really well. And that's the type of performance that's going to get you drafted early. It's going to get you on a team where hopefully you can get some, some healthy targets and create kind of a role for yourself. Now, I don't know if he's going to end up sort of like Jalen Waddle. I think Jalen Waddle's situation was really interesting to say the least. I mean, he walked in and he was the first wide receiver drafted in that class, excuse me, after, um, after or I'm, I'm blanking right now. Waddle was taken. He was first. He, he went to the dolphins. Yeah. He was first over Jamar chase, right? Yeah. yeah okay. That's, that's right. what I thought. I was blanking for a second. First wide oh, receiver. Wait, no, taken, wait, no, sorry. I was going to say Jamar chase went before. Sorry, him, yeah. Jamar right? chase. And then um, Jalen Waddle. yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, all after years of doing this, all the, all the draft picks and stuff, they just start to jumble. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Jalen Waddle second wide receiver drafted. And when he, when he walked into Miami, there was really nobody else there. I mean, Devontae Parker had had one good season in the past, what, five years before that, or the past four, four seasons before that. He was really only competing with Mike Gesicki for targets, right? Now, we know Jalen Waddle is a really good wide receiver, but he also walked into a situation where I would say it didn't nerf his overall age adjusted profile, right? Not having that breakout age. There were some signs that he was going to be a good wide receiver, but I don't think anybody, unless, unless you just know more than me, or you have, you know, you're just way smarter at investing in better players than me. I don't think we could have predicted he would have broke the, the rookie receptions um, record. I don't think we could have predicted necessarily that he would come out and have such a strong uh, foundation as an NFL rookie especially coming from what he gave us at Alabama with everything that, that his, his profile suggested. So I, I think Jamison Williams is giving us more than even more than what Jalen Waddle did, but it's going to come down to what team he lands on, what that draft capital looks like. Cause as, as far as I know too, right now, I, I wouldn't say it's consensus, but I'm seeing a lot of buzz about him being a first round selection in the NFL draft. Yep. That speed is going to be legit. People are going to want that. And, um, it just comes down to his situation. He can produce, but I think there's, I mean, maybe not an asterisk, but there's a little, there's some question there as to, you know, why he wasn't able to dominate that way at Ohio state. Was that wide receiver room too crowded? Maybe that's neither here nor there because I mean, it's, he went to Alabama and he absolutely dominated. And now he's going to be first round draft pick. So maybe we have to put that behind us, but um, it's not all, you know, peachy keen with him right now, but yeah. I do, I do like him pending the situation and the draft capital. I think he's shown that he can do it. Um, and he has another, you know, in, in this last year where he did break out, he showed us that he can have another wide receiver next to him. That's garnering a significant amount of targets and still outproduce them. So the way that I look at him at, at worst would be just kind of a fringe one, two kind of guy, one, two wide receiver guy. Um, and somebody that pending that, that, that right draft capital and right team situation is going to be somebody that you can you can spend maybe a late first on in my opinion i'd be kind of comfortable with that that late first round pick on 
um, depending on where he goes. But he's yeah, he's in a weird situation, similar to kind of how how Waddle was last draft cycle. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely uh, he's going to be an intriguing one. I think the thing that makes me very interested in him is a uh, friend of the show, uh, Jared Wackley over at Dynasty Nerds. Uh, those of you guys that don't know, uh, they, Dynasty Nerds do a nerd score for film, which is like pre-draft capital, and they did that for the first year last year. And Jared was actually one of the most accurate uh, analysts. And I've, you know, I've been good friends with Jared and good friends with Garrett Price over there. That's where I started out. And I rely on them a lot for, uh, for film stuff because they are putting their, you know, they're putting their, you know, reputation online, so to speak, because they're putting their grades out there. I mean, I don't see too many film guys going out and publishing their grades on a year to year basis so that, because frankly, if they did, they would get dunked on because, you know, just using film doesn't really get you that far, but these guys have been able to figure out a formula that's been better than draft capital so far. So, you know, Jared Wackley, he like, he texts me, he sends me voice chats all the time. I don't know why he sends me freaking voice text, but he does. It. Like, <laughs> yeah. I get, I get him from him too. Yeah. yeah he'll send me, he'll <laughs> yeah. send me a little voice chat. I'm like, dude, just, just fucking text me you boomer. <laughs> and, uh, but anyways, he'll send me this stuff. And one day he sent me one. He's like, yo, what do you think of Jameson Williams? I think he's like an incredible player. So when someone tells me that it really gives me pause, right? It's not as easy for me to just completely write them off because of the numbers. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, if someone that really understands the game and understands these things are telling me to hey, pay attention to this guy, I absolutely will pay attention. Now, am I going to put him in like my top three, top four? No, I'm never going to do that. I didn't do that with yeah. Jalen Waddle either. I, it was always Jamar Chase and it was like Rashad Bateman and stuff like that ahead of him. But, you know, when they tell me that I do need to pay attention, I do think he will go in the first round because speed, speed plus Alabama premium alone will probably just get him there. Uh, based on what he was able to do this year so you'll have to adjust for them but yeah it's really going to get really interesting to see what what we should do in that back part of the first round like are you going to pull the trigger on a jameson williams or are you going to pull the trigger on one of these dodgy quarterbacks or are you going to pull the trigger on one of these dodgy running backs and i think that's like a little bit of a good segue here into how to approach this rookie draft you know Historically speaking, like I always focused on like quarterbacks and running backs because wide receivers, there's just so many of them. Uh, and especially in today's day and age, like the, the targets are getting more and more distributed. There's less and less target hogs. There's like only one or two Cooper Cups and Devontae Adams every single year, right? Everyone else is kind of like from wide receiver five to like wide receiver 20. Like you're all kind of getting blended together a little bit. Um, so I, I, I definitely used to always favor that. But in this class, I'm just like so unsure about draft capital for the quarterbacks. And I'm so unsure about draft capital for the running backs. So that, you know, absent that draft capital input right now, I actually have wide receivers ranked at the top of my rookie rankings. And I'm sure that'll change if like, you know, Malik Willis goes like top 10 or top five or something like that. Right. Then that'll obviously change. Let's say, let's say Malik Willis goes to like Carolina and a sixth overall, then that's going to boost him heavily. But right now I don't know, like he could go there. He could go, you know, 11 to 15. He could go back to the first, like there's no consensus on this class at quarterback. So it becomes really challenging for me uh, to kind of weigh the risks and benefits of drafting quarterback early. I saw a tweet from you that you said, you know, very, very confidently, like I've never, you know, I felt the urge to draft a someone that's not a quarterback and super flex at the 1.01 overall. Do you still feel that strongly for this class, uh, given the question marks there, or are you also adjusting and pivoting? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to be pivoting regardless of how everyone thinks about this, this quarterback class. The, the, the thing is, is like I said, in that tweet is quarterbacks retain value quicker and longer than any other position in fantasy football. It's 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 more of a power play rather than going with it. It's, it's not even power play. It's more of a market play rather than um than than going with my gut personally. You know, I can I can talk wide receivers all day because I think that I'm most most comfortable being able to evaluate them, and my process is just heavily revolved around being able to identify and and drop these wide receivers in success buckets. Now, I compensate for my lack of knowing other positions by making sure that when I do invest draft capital in my, in my dynasty rookie drafts, that when I'm, when I am investing that capital that I'm investing on almost surefire things. Now, no quarterback is a surefire thing, but what I can tell you is a surefire thing is that we have, you know, Trey Lance and Trevor Lawrence, both going as top 20 dynasty assets in startups right now, mm -hmm. and are being heavily favored for, you know, very high right now, very, very high rookie picks. And Trevor Lawrence is coming off an absolutely, you know, where he didn't even crack the top, um, the top 24 in quarterbacks, I believe. And Trey Lance only played a couple games and was used in, used in like rushing sub packages. 
in especially in super flex leagues, the quarterbacks are going to be valued more even based off of what we don't know about them rather than a wide receiver. I mean, let's use Jamar Chase have an absolutely just an electric rookie season. And it, per the, 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 the ADP that I had seen from January, I think Jamar Chase was taken three, four, maybe five spots max in a super flex draft over Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is still being valued after the season that we just saw from him is still being valued at a top 15 pace, just like almost directly after one of the most prolific wide receivers we've seen in a long, in a long time outside of Justin Jefferson. So for me, it's like at the back end of that first round, even in the middle of the first round, if Kenny Pickett, you know, gets drafted by the Broncos, I am picking him in the in the middle of the first round. I'm going to take that and I'm going to I'm going to hitch my wagon to that because I know that he's going to come in and he's likely going to be a starter. Now, obviously that's pending, you know, what they do in free agency, but if they take him in the first round, I'm going to draft I'm going to draft Kenny Pickett and I'm going to I'm just going to watch his value even if he has a just absolutely god awful season like Zach Wilson levels of bad. He's still going to retain value. There are people in your leagues right now that will still pay you a late first, probably even you know mid first, depending on their situation, for Zach Wilson. And all signs point to him continuing to struggle potentially. But we like to tell ourselves and believe that we need to give these quarterbacks a little bit more time to you know assess the landscape of the NFL. They need more opportunity for the team to be built around them. It's just the market suggests that quarterbacks will retain value longer. So I'm I'm going to grab whatever quarterback I can because I know that in the long run, even if Traylon Burks goes absolutely bonkers and Kenny Pickett, you know, or Malik Willis or something could do the absolute average, I'm going to be able to get Traylon Burks plus plus based off of, you know, a Malik Willis who does average in the future. And I could return that investment and I can draft, I could do Traylon Burks plus maybe a late round first or something. If Malik Willis has good rushing upside, he looks great. He does the absolute average. Traylon Burks may be a late first or something like that. At that point, I've already gotten my Traylon Burks. I got him back. And then the guy that I really wanted to draft, and then I got a, another first round pick on top of that. And I'm going to go invest that in another quarterback that I'm going to flip for another first round pick and a really good player. It's just the value retention of that position. I don't see myself getting away from it. And that's kind of playing just the game of, you know, acquiring and flipping, acquiring and flipping. And that's the fun part about dynasty is that there's a lot of different tactics to it, but that's kind of my approach to this class, no matter how bad it is, I'm confidently going to take a quarterback and going to, um, going to retain that value and hopefully, hopefully flip it for, for even more. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, I'm definitely, that's how I normally view it as well. And like, if the draft capital plays out, like there, there's going to be a lot less question marks for me. Like if Kenny, if Pickett goes high, I have a rule where like, if a quarterback kind of gets drafted in that top 15, right. I ne- I'll never let him fall out of the first round of a super flex. Like it doesn't matter how much I hate him. I don't care. Like yeah, I hated Josh Allen. I hated Daniel Jones. You know, I hated all these guys, but at some point you could have flipped that for profit. Uh, yeah. No matter what. So I have that. So what they said about that. Justin Herbert though, too. Yeah. Justin you know, Herbert. he's, I remember during I said that about Justin Herbert, but even, even I said about Justin Herbert, I hated him, but as yeah. soon as he fell to late first, I'm like, okay, this is an auto pick for me. Yeah, dude, the 2020 draft cycle, there was a lot of people that knowing that Philip Rivers had moved on and that Justin Herbert was the sole, you know, he was going to be the starting quarterback. There were people that were still letting him fall to the early second. And that is That's blasphemy. Yeah. And now if you've gotten him there, what can you get? And of, listen, I know Justin Herbert, I, I don't think he's an anomaly at all because I mean, you there are really, obviously there's plenty of great quarterbacks that come out that are taken early, but the fact that you would let him slip to that early second, mid second, wherever you got him. And now, I mean, I don't, I haven't even looked at any trades for Justin Herbert because I just know I don't have the firepower <laughs> to obtain him right now. Yeah. But like, if you did get him for a second round pick or even like one, one 11, one 10 to one 12, anywhere in there, you are literally, you could trade him and build a brand new dynasty team for yourself. And I think yeah. that's the appeal. And that's the gamble that I will always take on a quarterback position, because the reality is, like you said, you have, you know, wide receivers that are at the top of your board right now. I would probably go ahead and say that the majority of the players that are at the top of my board in terms of just skill set that I actually know are going to produce are, yeah, they're all generally all wide receivers, but they're not going to have the market that a quarterback is going to have year two and beyond. And that kind of sways me into making a smart investment that I can flip and really build that dynasty um, that that's sustainable, at least for a couple of years and put yourself in a position where you can win rings. Yeah. 
for sure. And like normally, yeah, I would definitely go that path. But I'm, I'm, this is why, like, I think this is like one of the one of the years where I'm so heavily waiting on draft capital. Like in years past, I you we had a pretty good sense of where guys were gonna go. Like that top of the first round, like we knew Jonathan Taylor was gonna get drafted high. We knew DeAndre Swift was gonna get drafted high. We did not know Ch was gonna get drafted high, but like all the wide receivers, like CD Lamb, et cetera, et cetera. Last year, we knew Jamar Chase going high. We knew Jalen Waddle was going high. Like we knew all these things. We knew Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. Trey Lance, Zach Wilson. We knew all these guys going high this year. I just don't fucking know. And with, once I get the answers, I will definitely shift more towards that approach. Um, but one thing I do want to like talk about with you is like for quarterbacks, especially like I think historically speaking, it was definitely like very, very secure. Right. Uh, but I think what we're seeing more, more recently in the past few years, like teams are getting a little bit more restless with their young quarterbacks. You know, we're not, we're not getting the same, uh, patience that we had with back in the Manning days, right? We're not, they don't have that. They're not afforded that same opportunity. You look at like Dwayne Haskins washed out within like a year and a half, right? Josh Rosen washed out a year and a half. Sam Darnold had three years, which was two years too long to prove that he's one of the worst quarterbacks in the league and now washed out. So I think that that rope is getting a little bit, a little bit tighter, a little bit shorter. So that safety blanket is not there as much now, but to your point, Malik Willis, what he has going for him is the rushing upside. Uh, so if he gets the draft capital and he gets the rushing, uh, I'm much more comfortable taking that swing on him. But if he goes in like that 15 to 20 range, you do not have the same security blanket that a Trevor Lawrence or a uh, Trey Lance, you know, or uh, one of these guys has. So I think that value insulation is a little bit more risky. It's still there for sure, but it's a little bit more risky. Whereas if I can, I feel like pretty confident in, in pushing the chips in on like a Drake London, uh, you know, like a trail and Burks. So if I'm drafting before the NFL draft, personally, I'm going to pull the trigger on one of those guys because I, I know that they're pretty much a lock for first round draft capital and first round draft capital with that type of production profile uh, and that type of age adjusted uh, production is, is usually not a surefire hit. There's no such things, but like it's as surefire hit as you'll get in, in fantasy football. And, 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 you know, in those early rounds of the rookie draft of those early picks, my goal is to not pick, uh, not pick a bust that that's really, that's how I'm not, I'm not really good at identifying good players. I am, I am good. And I think as a community, we're much better at saying like, this guy is probably not very good. than like, this guy is going to be very good. And by the process of elimination, that's how you get to the trail and Burks and the Garrett Wilson's like, well, they don't have any red flags and they check X, Y, Z. And they're like the best of the last remaining. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, uh, from it at, uh, you know, you're probably right in that you, you definitely still need to kind of value the quarterback position. It's just, there's just so many question marks about where these guys are going to go. I mean, a month ago, and Matt Coral was like the the undisputed like top yeah. quarterback. He was slinging it and then busted his knee, and now it's like, oh well, is he even going to be the third quarterback? Is he even going in the first round? It, like, it, you know, that's how that's how crazy this class has gotten. If it's just a roller coaster ride of emotions in terms of where their projected draft capital is, and that's that's really the trick with dealing with this class. And that's why people say this class is weak, right? You know, we normally anchor to a quarterback running back like the really high value positions to show if a class is good or not and, and this class is really soft in those areas and it's really strong um at the wide receiver position which is why you see guys like me kind of like you know tilting a little bit towards that end yeah no i respect that too and um again two di two different like kind of strategies here i i would say like maybe a little bit more of a conservative approach because you're confident in, in what the wide receivers are signaling to you. And like you said, your strategy is to not pick a bust. You don't want to spend that early first round pick or even mid first round pick on a bust. But I would say that's probably because I'm not, I'm not super risk averse when it comes to my dynasty drafts. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more about legitimately trying to build that dynasty and trying to retain value with players that I know, or, um, I'm trying to obtain value with players that I know can retain that for a long period of time. So if I do find myself in a situation um, where I need to trade out or I need to, you know, uh, maybe one of my running backs goes down or one of my wide receivers or so on and so forth, then I have, you know, chips that I can just kind of throw in. And I think like speaking to your point, that's probably one of the, one of the reasons I'm more uh, comfortable picking at the back end of this first round 
Yeah. It, right now, I would say that like I, I I'm I'm more comfortable picking at the back end of this first round right now, letting somebody else kind of land on you know that mine if it is a mine and like go ahead you know like because I feel like the uh, because people are going to value a quarterback too, uh, people are going to value the quarterback position. You can let somebody else maybe take the risk on 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 a Malik Willis while you know Drake London is going to slip to like that mid round range and you know you're getting a surefire thing there. Um, and I do respect that approach. I do. I do. Mine is a little bit more risky One I'm willing to gamble on, because also I think that although the, 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 the rope is kind of lessening for the quarterback position, we're seeing a lot of teams that are just, you know, if you know, the guy isn't the guy, you know, he's not the guy. I mean, case in point, Josh Rosen and, and Kyler Murray situation right there. But I would always, I, I would also say that, you know, wide receivers, for example, I mean, let's off the top of my head, I'm looking at, um, say a Kadarius Tony, if mm-hmm. he, he did, he was had an injured, injured, injury riddled season, rookie season, and people are pretty much off of him until dug, double digit rounds and startups right now. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, even though he has that first round capital, the, the length of time that we're willing and that the market holds that value for quarterbacks is double because if, if, if Malik Willis comes in and does the bare minimum and he just is not, you know, he shows no signs of being maybe NFL ready. People are always going to say, you know what? It's, it was just something about that season. He's a rookie, you know, it's fine. Let's, let's just give him one more year. The same thing with Josh Rosen. After they drafted Kyler Murray, people were trying to obtain Josh Rosen as much as, as much as they could because they wanted to give him that one extra year when the writing was on the wall, but people don't want to believe in that. You know what I'm saying? If you can play that and you can really play into that. I think you, you have, an edge there for sure yeah yeah for sure i think i let's talk a little bit about uh some of these veteran players um and those how we'll kind of round up the episode here uh you talked about Kadarius tony so i was mm-hmm. vehemently against Kadarius tony as a rookie before yeah. we saw him play in the nfl after seeing him play now that people dislike him i find myself on the other side where like hey he's shown enough uh in the games that he did play he was pretty fucking good and you know it's like you know and i see this is the problem that i see a lot with with our analytics bros is the extremes of both sides can be very very frustrating to talk with you know the extreme film bros and the extreme analytics bros because they all hang on to like the very extreme ends but you know i see all i see all the time like oh well Kadaris tony only did good because you know, because Kenny G was injured and Sterling Shepard was injured and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, okay. But like, you know, we all subscribe, subscribe to the concept that targets are earned, not given. So then how can we now flip the script just because a guy we didn't like coming in is earning those targets in the absence of others to then discount those targets. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of the thought that what he showed, and I'm sure you have this more from like a yards per route run data. Um, he was pretty damn good, uh, pretty, pretty efficient with the targets he did, did get. So he wasn't just a Kelvin Benjamin soaking up targets, you know, in the absence of talent and not doing anything with them. The targets he did get was really good. And frankly speaking, when I was watching him play, it was very, very exciting to watch him put defenders on skates like time and time again. The way he moves is very, very unique. And even coming out of college, uh, I admit, I had to admit that like, Hey, this guy's this is an exciting player. He is a fantastic athlete uh, in terms of what he's been able to do. Now his production sucked. So I didn't like him as a prospect, but now that we've seen him in, in, in the NFL, why can't he be like a Terry McLaurin light? And, and a lot of people were slow to adjust to a Terry McLaurin because of how horrible his college profile is. Right. But you know, my approach is when I see something in the NFL, uh, that really starts to outweigh the college profile a bit. The college profile only can hold for so long. Like, you know, you can only hang on to Nikhil Harry and Jalen Rager for so long before we finally admit that they're just not very good players, right? Um, whereas on the flip side, how much evidence do you need uh, in order to buy into a player after they get into the NFL? And players like Adarius Tony, players like Terry McLaurin, uh, I find myself you know, acquiring them players like Brandon, Ayuk, like Chase Claypool, all these guys that guys that I did not like. And as an analytic community, we did not like, and as a, as a result drove their price down. I usually find myself profiting on the back end when they do prove themselves in the NFL. And I'm usually faster to pivot my stance than other people that want to hang on to priors. So, so I, it's interesting. You brought up Kadir's Tony and anyone that follows me on the, on the channel is following for a long time, probably thinks like, I think he stinks. Right. But I don't. I think that based on his price now, you're looking at double digits, 
first round draft capital guy that in the opportunity that he did get posted a couple double target games, right? Which is not easy to do. And on those targets was pretty efficient with them on a yards per run basis. I think that's the bull case for Kadarius Tony. Yeah. So first, first and foremost, I just want to say, I'm really excited to be in the presence of a Kadarius Tony truther right now. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought maybe this was like a lone person's club. I thought maybe <laughs> I was standing on this Island by myself. Um, you made a couple of really good points after only after so long, can we really look at somebody's college profile and, and, and still like pound the table for them and say, they did this in college and that's why they're doing this in the NFL. Um, and in some cases we get really cool instances where players who did not and who underperformed in college come in and do really, really well in the NFL. I think case in point would probably be like a Jalen Waddle minus a couple things. And, for, for a, a big example would be um, Kadarius Tony, who a breakout age is 21, came in with like a college dominator of like 22%, which is really, really low on, you know, a, a overall calculation for him. But with that being said, Kadarius Tony showed us that he is actually in a tier that I don't think a lot of people are willing to admit um, that he belongs in right now. And that's a, a pretty, pretty special group of players. Um, what really turned me on to Kadarius Tony is not only was he really, really fun to watch, like you said, um, but outside of all the injuries, outside of everything, on the volume that he did garner, he was extremely, extremely efficient with. And he actually really, really outproduced any ADP that he, he was being drafted at. Wherever you got for him, he already outproduced that with an injury-riddled season. So I'm going to kind of tie this back into my yards per route run study that um, we were talking about earlier with rookies. Um, I calculated pretty much grabbed all the data that I could on yards per route run for rookies dating all the way back to 2009. So it's about 13 years, give or take, maybe I'm off by like a year or something quick math. Um, so it's from 2009. I, I grabbed every single rookie wide receiver and I calculated what their statistics were. I looked at, you know, an efficiency metric yards per route run. And I kind of formulated these buckets to which what the average was. So in the sample, in this entire sample, I have 122 total wide receivers with over 50 targets. Now the average yards per route run is, um, is 1.59 among the entire sample. So, just going to throw some quick numbers out um, so you guys can get a, a quick understanding of what, what I'm talking about because this might be gibberish to a lot of people. But um, wide receivers in this sample that exceeded the average of 1.59 yards per route run was 50%, 50.8 mm -hmm. to be exact, 62 wide receivers. Wide receivers who exceeded the average and hit a top 24 fantasy season, 40, uh, hitting at a 64% clip. Wide receivers who exceeded the average and hit a top 12 fantasy season is 24 at about a 38% clip. Um, wide receivers who did not hit that, um, that 1.59 average yards per route run in this sample, their rookie season um, was 60. So uh, about 50% um, of, of the entire field. Wide receivers who did not exceed the average and went on to hit a top 24 fantasy season was only 10, about a 16% clip. Wide receivers who did not exceed the average of 1.59 yards per route run and went on to hit a top 12 fantasy season, only three, hitting at about a 5% clip there. So if you're picking up what I'm putting down, wide receivers who do not pass the average of yards per route run their rookie season in efficiency, regardless of with at least 50 targets or more, they do not do well. Only three of them have ever went on to have a top 12 fantasy season, only 10 of them out of 122 have gone on to have top 24 fantasy seasons at the wide receiver position. I promise I'm getting to a point here. I promise I'm getting to, to something really slick. Um, so when I did this study with yards per route run data, I looked at what are the thresholds for like elite level wide receivers here with um, over 50 targets, their, their, their rookie year. And I came into names like Percy Harvin, Akeem Nix, uh, Doug Baldwin, AJ Green, Julio Jones, Keenan Allen, Odell Beckham, Mike Evans, the list goes on, Tyreek Hill, M Michael Thomas, um, names like that, guys that we all know and love. Now, the threshold that you arrive at with these wide receivers is two yards per route run. Okay, so that is the minimum for what we look at, a, a rookie wide receiver that comes in and, and garners a two yards per route run minimum goes on to have a top 12 um a top 12 fantasy uh, season at a 60% clip. So of the wide receivers in the sample that exceeded that two point, uh, that, that two yards per out run, um, only 23 of them did. 
19 of those hit a top 24 season and 14 of those hit a top 12 season. Now here's where we tie everything back. There's only two wide receivers in this 2021 class that exceeded a two yards per route run threshold. Can you just give me a wild guess, Michael, on what those two guys are? Kadarius Tony. Kadarius Tony and Jamar Chase. Yeah. So Kadarius Tony tying it back in is I like he was stupid efficient on the volume that he did get. He produced with it. I know I threw a lot of numbers at, at, at a lot of people, but historically speaking, over the past 13 years, wide receivers that hit that two yards per route run threshold tend to go on and have really really successful fantasy seasons at the very least 82% of the, the the wide receivers that are hitting that clip go on to have a top 24 fantasy season. And you can go and acquire a guy like Kadarius Tony for literally, I mean, a, a, what a mid second, maybe I've, that. And that's at worst for somebody who might still have a little bit of hope for him. Yeah. You know, you can go and acquire him and he has a high probability of, of, of returning tenfold on that investment. So, um, I think that's just that, that that's some cool stuff that I came up with in, in my yards per route run study. Um, when we look at Jamar chase, obviously at the top of the heap there, um, I, I just went on a really long tangent with a lot of numbers. So I don't even, I don't even know what the fucking point is. Uh, well, well, I don't I can't even remember what you asked, but all I know is that Kadarius Tony is an absolute buy. I love him. I think you should go out and try and snag him for whatever you can. Um, he's not going to cost you much in your fantasy leagues. And he's, he's a really, really good investment right now. Um, yeah. And, and weird side note too, Hunter Renfro, I know a lot of people wrote him off early in his career because the first um, three seasons uh, of his entire career, excuse me, the first two seasons of his entire career didn't even crack like the top, um, didn't crack the top 50 in fantasy, but he was actually a player who topped um, two yards per route run um, in his rookie season and then went on to have a top 12 fantasy season in year three. So if you're investing in these guys, sit a little bit longer, understand that like these guys do pop. And they will. They have shown you that they are efficient on on the volume that they that they do get, and they're they're, they're just good investments, man. They're great investments. Yeah, I I, I definitely agree with you, Hunter Renfro, Dad Bod King, and a so, legend. Uh, you know, I actually I traded from across a couple of leagues just to have him in that like wide receiver three four flex. He was a perfect player for that. But yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more, man. I think you know just looking at the numbers looking at what he was able to do in his first year, frankly, looking at, you know, the film as well. I think Darius Tony is, and I can't believe I'm saying it, but I think he's a pretty decent target as well. Uh, so I, I definitely agree with you there. And I, and I think I agree with you that he, he can be had for pretty cheap, right? Because, yeah. you know, the people that drafted him didn't really pay that much for him because he was super cheap. He probably got him in the late second, you know, early third. Um, he didn't have a great year by, you know, raw statistics standards, right? But if you look at some of the advanced metrics that, you know, Jesse just went through in terms of his yards per route run, in terms of uh, the target share and the games he did play, uh, it does put him. It does put him in like some elite company. Now we're not saying Kadarius Tony is Mike Evans or Kadarius Tony is this or he's that. What we're saying is, you know, looking at those peripherals, he is is more closer to that group than the group of bums, which he is currently being drafted a lot amongst, right? Exactly. So that's the key. And he's still very young. It's his second year in the league. And this is the, the, the years two to three, that's the best buy windows for a lot of wide receivers uh, because you have the college data, you have the first year NFL data, which is arguably the most sticky uh, of, of everything. You know, people say you got to be patient with wide receivers, which is true, but you got to be patient with the ones that showed you something in year one that showed you something in year two. And I think Kadarius Tony kind of fits that bill and he's, and he's coming at a heavy, heavy discount. So when, uh, you know, obviously anyone that, that is in leagues that plays with me that watches this video next week uh, are probably not going to trade with me anymore, but if those that aren't, I'm definitely going to start exploring uh, acquiring a Kadarius Tony. I think really the best move to me is when, when you're on your rookie draft. So I, at this time of the season, I am, I am, I flip from a buyer of rookie picks into a seller of rookie picks. So as I'm leading up to the draft with the NFL combine coming in, uh, you know, that's a one selling point when the NFL draft hits, that's another selling point. Like, you know, if I'm asking myself, you know, would I rather have a Kadaris Tony or a Chris Olave? I think those are some interesting conversations, Would I'd rather have a Kadaris Tony or a Jamison Williams, right? Like, that late part of the first, early part of the second, you will easily be able to flip into a Kadaris Tony because all the attention will have shifted to the rookie class, which will allow you to time target some of these valuable veterans. 
Um, so that, I think that's the best time to kind of buy Kadaris Tony. That's what I'm going to be looking to explore as well is trying to get some of those, flip those like early second, mid second round picks, maybe mid second plus a third or whatever, and try and flip it into Kadaris Tony and see what happens. Because uh, let, I mean, let's be honest, like Kenny, Kenny G is just not, not really the answer that people are looking for. <laughs> Sterling Shepard, who I freaking love, and I'm going to continue drafting him best ball can never play a full season. Right. And so they need, they need someone to kind of step up into that role. And in, in the very brief moments that he had, he absolutely flashed. So, yeah. So yeah. Um, so yeah, worth, anyway, that, I was going to say worth, worth noting there too, that um, I believe the giants have an out on Sterling Shepard and Darius Slayton as well, this upcoming season to cut, to cut them for cap space. Like, yeah. I mean, Kadarius, Tony healthy. If he only has to compete with Kenny G, I mean, we're talking potential fireworks there too. Like we're, we're talking potential like yeah. fireworks based on historical data. And, um, and, and, and he looks good. And like you said, I think it's just the price at which you can acquire that ceiling for yeah. is just, just so cheap, man. You got to go out and go, you have to go out and go grab him, man. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, we will wrap this up. It's been a great uh, session here with the homie, uh, Jesse, Jesse. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this uh, little show of mine and uh, entertaining the folks, dropping some knowledge uh, on the wide receivers, dropping some knowledge on the statistics. I appreciate it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm super pumped to kind of have you back in the community. Uh, you know, I was, I was still following along with you with all the gaming stuff, but it's just great to have uh, you know, someone that kind of, kind of really, rose to fame you know during the same time that i was kind of you know getting getting my feet wet into the community so uh thanks so much let let the people know once again you know where do they go to find you you know how do they support you uh and and how do they you know basically just give you that internet fist bump so to speak yeah man you guys can i'm pretty much the only place right now that you guys can find me is on twitter at jesse reeves ff and um just to kind of share the same sentiment man i do appreciate you getting me on here um and and it's like i said it's been a pleasure watching you grow in just not just the fantasy industry but just other areas of life and stuff man and um you're somebody that i admire and somebody that uh if if you come calling i will i will definitely be hopping on anytime you need me dude so thank you again i appreciate it anybody that's made it this far into the podcast or the show or whatever you know like thank you appreciate you guys all right that's all i got for you guys this week if you liked hit the thumbs up hit the subscribe button hit the notifications you're going to get interviews like this strategy content you know players draft analysis all that shit on the bdg channel for myself both the noah's godfather himself all off season long uh and again you can hop on to over to the bdg discord as well and and sign up and become a member of that community and uh yeah man we're going to be here all off season because as everyone knows in the dynasty community man there is no off season. All right. Until next time. Peace.